Good morning. My name is Julie Smith, and I'm the Executive Director of the Identity Defined Security Alliance. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to be here at Identiverse and to introduce you to the IDSA and our session today, 21, 2021 Trends in Identity Security. The IDSA has been focused on raising awareness about the importance of identity management and securing digital identities for several years. We are a nonprofit, membership driven organization that facilitates community collaboration to help organizations reduce risk through identity defined security. Our membership is comprised of leading identity and security vendors who have come together to focus on helping organizations understand the importance of identity and security strategies and digital transformation initiatives. In addition, we have a talented team of identity and security leaders who sit on our customer advisory board. They represent the practitioner community, provide guidance on our mission, and act as identity champions with their peers and in the security community. Our speakers, Bernard and Clint, are members of our customer advisory board. I'm sure you've heard the stats from the Verizon data breach incident report. 81% of hacking related breaches involve a weak or stolen password. And our own research has shown that 79% of organizations suffered an identity related breach in the last two years. Identities have become the prime target for hackers and the easiest method of breaching an organization. The need to secure identities and the data and systems they are used to access is more important than ever. In response to this challenge that organizations are facing, the Identity Defined Security Alliance has developed a set of resources that are available at no cost on our website. At idsalliance.org, you'll find a collection of research, white papers, webinars, and blogs. In addition, the IDSA has also developed a framework that provides best practices for establishing a solid foundation. With this foundation, you can then layer security technologies to protect data and assets through identity defined security. So starting from the bottom up, we've published a number of best practices that cover IAM people, processes, and technologies. While not required for identity defined security, they are recommended to establish a solid foundation. The best practices encompass things like ownership and governance of identity and access management programs, critical processes for asset discovery and application onboarding, automation of provisioning and deprovisioning, and putting a focus on privileged access. Security outcomes and implementation approaches are the building blocks for achieving identity defined security. They have been defined by our technical working group and bring together identity and security capabilities to improve and organization security posture. Approaches are vendor neutral architectural patterns for implementing the outcome, and there are usually multiple approaches to achieving each outcome. An example of an outcome would be access is revoked but upon detection of a high risk event associated with that identity. A security policy has been defined, a monitoring tool, for example, UEBA or SIM, detects a violation of policy and sends an alert to a governance tool. The governance tool may revoke entitlements through deprovisioning until further review. And so we have, we've published 19 security outcomes to date and we'll continue to add to the library. And you'll see a subset of these outcomes referenced in the research that our panelists will discuss today. I encourage you to check out the framework and our other resources at idsalliance.org. So today we will discuss our latest report, 2021 Trends and securing digital identities, which was published just last week. As you'll hear today, the research makes it clear that the sudden shift to an online world had a significant impact on how organizations approach all aspects of securing digital identities. We also found out that almost every organization believes zero trust is important to their security strategy and that identity is a critical element. We also heard that zero trust is complex and can mean different things to different people. So as part of their introductions, I'm going to ask our panelists to tell us what zero trust means to them. So Bernard, if you would uh, do me the honor of introducing uh, yourself and uh, tell us what zero trust means to you. Sure, thanks, Julie. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Bernard Tivakar. I'm the Enterprise Security Chief Architect at Intuit. Um, to really um, 
simplify the the term zero trust i think i think the way i look at it is how how are we able to uh, ensure security controls are working effectively uh, by assessing risk on an ongoing basis and ensuring those controls are enforced consistently and also in a way that will not come in the way of a user um, or or become a bottleneck for the user to access resources great thank you uh, we're having a little bit of difficulty getting Clint to join in, um, but hopefully that will happen here shortly. Yeah, I'm not sure. There he is. Oh, there we go. Great. Gosh, Thank I'm so you. sorry. Perfect timing. Uh, Clint, if you would introduce yourself to the to the uh, the audience and also let us know what Zero Trust means to you. Yeah, my name is Clint Maples. Um, I lead a security team, a company called Robert Half. Um, I think when we talk about it internally, when we're simplifying it, we like to say that we should be treating all of our internal systems as if they were external systems. So that, you know, there really shouldn't be a security difference between the things that we have in our internal networks and the things that we intentionally ex uh, expose to the internet. Excellent. Thanks, Clint. Bernard, Clint, thanks so much for being here today. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, I want to introduce Diane Haglin, who is the co-founder of Dimensional Research, who conducted the survey and analyzed the results. Uh, Diane is going to lead the rest of the discussion. So Diane, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks so much, Julie. Hi, Clinton Bernard. I'm looking forward to our discussion uh, about this data. Um, before we dive into the data, as anyone who looks at research knows, you got to understand where it's coming from. So let me quickly walk you through what you're going to see today. Uh, this data is based on an online survey of just over 500 security and identity professionals in the United States working at a large company, which we defined as uh, 1,000 employees or larger. This is our third year in a row that we've conducted this study. And so we've been able to do some interesting analysis of how things are changing in the last few years. As Julie said, this data is hot off the presses and uh, very fresh. So I'm excited to share it with you today. Um, we're going to discuss three different areas. We're going to talk about the thing that I think has been on our minds the most the past year is remote work and what's that meant to identity security. Then we're going to look at some data on what's going on with breaches, what's happening, and what's happening with identity-related security outcomes that Julie uh, introduced to us and what's the impact of those. And then we're going to close by talking a bit about what's happening organizationally with um, our identity and security teams. So before we dive in, I want everyone listening in today to take a moment to just think for themselves what their theory is about what happened in the past 12 months. I think we can all agree that this has been a crazy, crazy year with remote work, but there's also been major new security breaches. There's also been significant investments in security and people like yourselves getting better and better at your jobs. So I want everyone to take a guess on what happened to identity related security breaches. Did they increase because the hackers are better? Did they decrease because the security teams are getting better? What happened? What's your guess? What do you think happened? And I will tell you. So with that number in mind, we see that it stayed flat. <laughs> um, the, we asked the question about um, whether a com the, their company has had an identity related breach in the past two years. And for those of you data people on the call who are thinking, wait, the past two years? Yes, so in, we asked the same question, 2020 covering, you know, um, the two years previous, and then we repeated that again. So there is a year overlap for you, uh, people like me who are very pedantic about data. But even so, we should be able to pick up a trend of what's going on uh, with what's happening. And we see that the data says it's consistent. 79% last year, 79% this year. And in fact, that lack of movement happens even when you drill down on the specific types of identity breaches, whether it's phishing or brute force or man in the middle, all of those things stayed pretty consistent in terms of the number of companies who've had one of those identity related breaches. 
So let's bring our experts in now here. Bernard, I'm going to start with you. Is this a surprise to you? Um, did you expect it to go up or down? Do you have a theory what's going on? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting uh, um, re revelation here through this uh, research. Uh, the, the one thing that is quite obvious here is that, you know, attackers don't get tired, right? Um, they're constantly going at finding all the vulnerabilities uh, that exist on the internet. Um, but but I think, I think um, um, you know, based on the number here, one of the aspects that could be at play, potentially aspect that could be at play is that many organizations are, have either begun or in the middle of their um, identity security outcome journeys. And, and, and sometimes, you know, uh, the, the adoption of these security controls take time. And so, so there is that there is that time period before which the maturity levels of an organization of implementing controls um, um, may not have reached the, the the highest level of maturity, and so there there are those kind of potential scenarios, which is why um, it, while they are not increasing, um, it's staying flat. Right, Clint. Same question to you. What does this data say to you? Maybe we don't have Clint. Um, we, we lost his audio, I think. Oh, double you? muted. Can oh. you hear me now? There you are. Hi, there Clint. we go. Sorry. When I <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, when I first saw this data, I was incredulous, and I went in and sort of uh, informally pulled a couple of security people that I know um, and phrased it just a little bit differently because it was like, oh, maybe we're calling it breaches, and people are thinking, well, I have incidents all the time, but not breaches. Um, and was again dumbfounded when some people answered that and the, the way I asked it was you haven't had a single like identity related security incident at all in the last year and several people said no and I was like well, you're a liar like how is that possible hmm. and as I dug into it more I realized like oh these are folks who have done you know are, are further along in that journey like Bernard was saying they've invested in MFA and single sign-on and they're already doing um, they're already looking at like uh, user behavior or um, doing health checks on the device when it's logging in. They're doing a lot of those sort of things that that we recommend, and they've actually seen dramatic reductions in their in their incidents or their breaches go down. So, yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. I'm wondering if maybe what's happening is as more people are starting that journey, that line is kind of meeting the like you know attacks are. I know we have certainly seen the attacks increasing, the attempts. But maybe um, the defenses are, are sort of rising to meet that and keeping everything flat. Right. Yeah, Clint, it's kind of a miracle that at least the number hasn't gone up, right? Because someone's doing a great job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on, we we're curious about remote work. You know, as I mentioned before, this means such a big part of our last year, and we were curious if anything happened with identities in the past year, you know, looking across identities, infrastructure, applications, devices, you know, what changed? And we're surprised to find out that most people, 83%, actually said that 80, uh, their number of identities increased. And again, to be clear, this is because specifically of COVID-19 and remote work, not just because they were hiring more people. And so, um, uh, Clint, I'm going to start with you on this one. Does this data surprise you at all? No, I think we, we've also been seeing this trend in our organization. Um, some of it has been compounded by the silicon chip shortage, not being able to get laptops. You know, so we've had a lot more employees who, or, or folks that are having to use their own personal devices, and there's some security risks with that. So we think, okay, well, let's set up some virtual desktop infrastructure so we can have sort of that device that we know is in a known good state and we can control. Uh, well, now we need, you know, there's new machine identities for each one of those. Uh, you can have new network identities for those as well. So we, we've certainly seen this number increase. Bernard, what about you? Is this uh, surprising to you? No, I think I think the key here is the the management of these identities, right? And the and the scope of the identities obviously has broadened, right, beyond the human identities to, as Clint mentioned, the device identities play a big part in this uh, in this uh, strategy, as well as the you know the non-human identities like things like bots that also have to be um, 
protected and secured. And so with folks, folks, I believe, who are adopting this, um, uh, you know, uh, trust but verify approach, they definitely are now having to deal with more identities than they had in the past. And Bernard, I know when we talked earlier, one of the things that uh, resonated with me that you said was you were talking about that word manage in there. And maybe it's not so much that um, they're, you know, so many identities, but they're managing more because they're outside the firewall. Um, yes. Did you want to yeah. maybe comment on that? Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think the other way to put it is, you know, the, the earlier comment we had around what, what does zero trust mean? And so, you know, there's no longer that, you know, safety or trust around, hey, we are behind the firewall, so, you know, we focus only those that are exposed to the external world. But now everything is on the internet, right? When you think about that uh, scope, then obviously the management of identity scope also increases. Great, excellent. Um, so, one of the interesting things we've been able to track now that we've done this study is a couple years is sort of general levels of confidence in a company's ability to effectively secure and manage different kinds of identities. And one of the things that really jumped out of the data this year was there was this extreme drop from 49% to 32% in the number of people who said, yeah, we're very confident specifically in our um, ability to uh, effectively keep our employee identities secure, which is such an enormous drop in just a single year. It feels like that has to have something to do with remote work uh, to see a movement like that in the data within a single year. So. Um, Clinton, Bernard, I'm really interested in your take on this. There's actually two things I'd like you to um, perhaps uh, share thoughts if you have them on this data. The first is what I just said about the drop in confidence around employee identities. Um, does that make sense that's related to remote work? Is there anything else going on? Do people just not trust their employees? And the other thing is those three bottom lines with machine identities, service accounts, application, machines, those actually did go up, uh, which is an interesting contrast to what happened with the um, uh, customer and employee identities. So Clint, let me start with you uh, and uh, toss those questions your way. Yeah, I liked this data point. It, it sort of rang true for me. I think, I think it was Mike Tyson who was quoted once saying, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And I think security teams got punched in the face this year. Um, you, you know, a lot of uh, friends and colleagues that I knew just implemented some cool new, you know, IGA, SSO, MFA technology. Uh, they've got, you know, the latest, greatest EDR, or XDR solution, and they're sort of feeling like, hey, I think we got this under control, right? We're in a pretty good spot. And then, you know, the ransomware wave of, of the last year and a half hit and, uh, you know, just sort of crashed down on everyone. And I think a lot of people are reconsidering that answer, sort of thinking, you know what, maybe, maybe I don't have this, or maybe we're not as as um, as well off as I thought we were, um, you know, we continue to be surprised by the things that uh, the bad guys come up with and the new ransomware variants and other little tricks and stuff that we see them doing and breaking into various places where, you know, for an area, it'll be sort of calm over here. And you think, oh, yeah, you know, that uh, the controls we have in place are really working. And then all of a sudden, you'll see just a bunch of stuff pop up and you're like, oh, dang it. You know, so uh, it, it's that that constant whack-a-mole, right? Yeah, and I I would like to chime in. I think the the other element here is also you know as you as you um, drive your identity security outcomes, I think one of the things that probably is weighing on these folks' mind is how are they able? Is that is that architecture or is that implementation strategy agile enough uh, to counter the new and emerging? Uh, ve attack vectors uh, that Clint pointed out. So the attackers are going to get very creative, um, really uh, hone in on the vulnerabilities that exist, right? Whether it be the supply chain attack model and things like that. So I think, I think, I think part of this is how how are how confident teams are in their in their investment that it is agile and being able to adapt and uh, uh, support uh, enforcing policies for new new attack vectors. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And Bernard, let me ask, what about these machine identities at the bottom getting better? Do you have a theory on that? Well, I think I think that that surprised me in in, in this in this uh, metric here. But 
But I think the, the other side of this is that given uh, the use cases relevant to machine and IOTs are new and emerging, mm. um, uh, the, and, and the solutions uh, folks are investing in are already coming in with, with solutions to address these kind of identities. So, so maybe that in that sense, um, that data point is, um, is, is accurate because there are a lot of technologies out there that are um, focusing on these type of identities. And uh, Cliff, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sir. I was just going to answer that too. I think when I answer that question um, for myself, it, it feels somewhat comparative. I think it's, 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 I'm kind of thinking back over the last year and where have we been fighting the most fires? And we've seen a big uptick in phishing. And you know, hey, I'm the CEO. Can you go get? Um, I pay or uh, iTunes gift cards from Walgreens and scratch off the number and send a picture of it to me. Um, so as I'm thinking about, you know, where do we have more risk in the organization? I would have certainly answered employees more than machine accounts or service accounts. Um, and I, some of that could also be where people are investing. I know that's an area that we've spent a lot of time working to control. So uh, mm -hmm. again, that's a, it's a data point that, that seems, seems, to ring true for me. So Clint, I have an impossible question, but I loved your analogy about Mike Tyson. And <laughs> is it just that these machine accounts, we haven't gotten the punch in the face yet and next year that will drop? I think absolutely. I th you know, if, if that became the next sort of ve vector, which I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, like the Verizon DBIR or other sort of data breach um, reports come out if uh, the data that, that they're reporting sort of corroborates this, right? That the, the the common vector, the most common way that people are getting in right now is malware and employee credentials and, and less the service accounts. I'm sure they're spreading that way, but people aren't really considering that as like, oh, this is where I need to go. So, you know, usually your service accounts are sort of behind something or, or have some other sort of controls applied uh, on top of them. Um, it's certainly something that people use to move laterally or escalate privileges, but it's often not where it starts. So, yeah, yeah and I think the as the famous adage goes, right, humans are the weakest link in the security chain. So, so that also kind of uh, corroborates that um, the the machine identities uh, once you put in controls and protect them, um, unless a human is intervening with that credential, mm -hmm. I think I think in that sense they they do get. Uh, uh, get protected pretty effectively. Yeah, and I'm hearing more of my peers, and Bernard, I wonder if you're hearing the same thing, um, are thinking about, well, what you've just said, and, and humans being the weakest link, right? And it's in maybe focusing less on trying to train and educate, and more on what can I do, what kind of safety net can I put under them, or guardrails can I put you know, next to them that prevent them from doing something that's unsafe, right? Because just exactly. sort of, yeah. you know, handing them a chainsaw and expecting like, oh, we're just going to, you know, teach them to use it safely. Like, no, 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 mm -hmm. you need to give them a safer tool. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's more realistic approach. Yep. Great. Um, perfect. Okay. So moving on. Um, one of the things we were really curious in understanding in this year's study is what really are the impact of these security breaches? I mean, certainly there's the one that makes the news. You know, obviously, I think it's pretty easy to articulate at Colonial Pipelines what happened when they had their security breach and the solar wind security breach. You know, there's these big things that make the news. But we saw 79% of companies saying that they had an identity-related breach, and not all of those were in the news. So, you know, how important were these? Did they actually impact the organization? We wanted to really get in and kind of... Um, get some get our get some data on what's going on with that and the answer in the data very clearly is yes these identity related breaches again looking just at the past two years did have a business impact uh, you see about eight and ten were able to you know articulate uh, some way in which their business were impacted it ranged you know our IT systems weren't available our employee data was taken you saw about one in five say that they had were a victim of ransomware um, you know so there was there's definitely impacts to this data uh, overall. And these breaches, even if you don't get in the news, have, you know, um, consequences overall. So, uh, Bernard, let me start with you. What jumps out at you when you look at this data? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there's also um, um, it's interesting that in uh, there hasn't been any mention about the, the reputation damage and the financial loss that a breach could result in. I think that that's a that's a dimension that I, I would be interested to see how how many people view it that way. Um, and so so yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, all those all those uh, impacts that have been listed here are, are relevant. But then but then I would also point out that you know financial and brand reputation is a big impact mm -hmm. uh, that, that becomes very hard to recover from for most companies. Yeah, and Bernard, it's interesting you say that because if you think of this other, you know, when people take the time when they're doing an online survey to write in the other, you want to really overweight what they say because that's more mental effort than to, you know, click on a button in a survey. And we certainly did see people writing in some specific examples of, you know, direct revenue loss, money actually being stolen from accounts. Um, the other thing, and you mentioned reputation, I think we saw that in two ways in this data. One, of course, the reputation of the company, but also the reputation of the IT team. We had several people refer to that as being, and that is a business impact, right? If you're, um, you know, not able to do your job because your organization doesn't trust you anymore, that's not uh, good. <laughs> so, um, uh, Clint, any thoughts from you on this uh, data? I want to talk to the people who said, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. like, like, or there was no impact that that feels like the man on the street interview where they you know ask somebody if they'd eat cicadas or something like that and they're like yeah, i'm not sure I'm like you're not sure what if i handed you one right now yeah i'm not sure what like i don't know it's just um i would well i i, I have trouble um getting in that headspace i mean if we had that kind of a breach i think there would absolutely be the impact um i mean just in with what we're seeing, you're going to have some loss of productivity, right? You're going to have loss of data. You're going to, where you'd have to notify all of our data custodians. I mean, it would be, yeah, it'd be bad. But Clint, I think that's such an important point is that it's not even so much not knowing about what the impact is, but it also means they're not thinking about it, right? And so if these breaches are happening and no one is asking the question, <laughs> hey, yeah. what did that's not good. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe they're taking that and, you know, taking it down from breach to the more common, I think, if we want to say incident, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, because we do, you you might have, oh, we had uh, malware land on a laptop somewhere and we uh, contained it and quarantined it and flattened it and shipped them a new device and everything was fine. We lost, mm -hmm. you know, three hours of employee productivity, right? So I guess if I was thinking about those types of things, I would say, yeah, the, I don't think there really was an impact. So maybe that's mm -hmm. what they meant. But let me ask you, Clint, if you're if one of your employees lost three hours of productivity because of malware, do you think that's just normal business or is that a bad thing? Well, it depends. If it were me, I mean, you can ask my team. I'm not very productive, so they wouldn't mind at all if I was knocked <laughs> offline for a couple of hours. But the, the, we do have a lot of people in the organization that 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 would be an impact. But from a like um, the goals of a like an SLA of the security team, if we're sort of hitting those um, service levels for especially for our remote remote employees, that's something I would be very happy to talk to the board about, you know, hey, we got this person back online. Really anything within 24 hours, I think would be, would be really great. That's great. So switching gears, we do want to spend a little time talking about the identity related security outcomes. We've been referring to those, Julie introduced those, uh, Bernard referred to those in some of his comments, this is Clint, and I want to, we, we really dug into this in the report. There's more in the white paper, but I wanted to touch on a few things that jumped out at us um, while we're on the call today. Uh, so for those of you who are my age and use special glasses with a computer, don't worry so much about reading the, you know, all the little details. But we did go and asked about the current level of implementation of each, and we focused on eight specific identity-related security outcomes. And what we really see here, I think, is a story of the fact that these identity-related security outcomes are a work in progress. While some of these outcomes, the one at the top of the list, things like um, you know granting privileged access rights by principle of least privilege or revoking access if you're detecting a high-risk event or even, you know, MFA, um, 
they're getting close to half of people who fully implemented those, but there's not a single outcome where, you know, more than half are reporting that they're fully implemented. There's a lot of blue here in progress. Uh, fortunately, there's not very much red where people don't even have plans to do this. So these are happening. Um, but I see a picture here of just like, there's a lot of thought and effort being put into this, but we're not there yet. So Clint, let me start with you. I know there's a lot on this slide, but I'm wondering if there's something that jumps out at you. The 4% of companies who have no plans to implement MFA jumps out at me. Hmm. Like really? I, I mean, maybe user friction is just such a critical priority, having that be as low as possible, I guess. But it just, it seems like sort of table stakes at this point. Um, I think number one is maybe easy to lie to yourself about. Your privilege access rights are granted according to least privilege. I, I think most people look at that and say, you know, they built some role a long time ago and aren't reviewing it on a regular basis or they, they're, you know, it, it, you, some, somebody comes out and is doing like a self-assessment questionnaire. You're like, yeah, 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 we do that, like ish. Um, yeah, two is interesting. I wonder how many people think account lockout after six failed and failed login attempts counts for this. Like, you know, when we think about this as an identity defined security outcome, uh, that's not how I how I read it. Right, I'm looking at things like actual user behavior. Like this person just logged in from someplace I've never seen before, or a browser that I haven't seen before, something like that that causes me to elevate. Um, yeah, I think. I think MFA should probably be the first priority. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it almost, uh, you, another way to read this might be, this seems to be the order that people are implementing or, or approaching mm -hmm. these controls in. Um, and I know for us, uh, you know, it, it, well, and a lot of, I think my friends, MFA is our, is our first priority. Okay. Bernard, any other, anything you'd add here? Yeah, I think I, I think I what what drew my attention is also um, the device characteristics that are used for authentication, and we touched upon this topic, right? The scope of identities is beyond the human identities, and and device identity is such an important part of an identity defined security approach. So there, I I I think if if it is in the order of priority, I would say that 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 should be somewhere up in the top two. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that 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 data also is uh, interesting to see. But this the good part is there are full, you know thirty one percent I think who are invested in it. But there's a a big blob of red there that 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 is what I'm focused in on. Yeah, and I guess least privilege sort of makes sense. I mean that's been a requirement for public companies since Sarbanes Oxley was passed almost twenty years ago. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so continuing on thinking about these outcomes, we were curious to find out sort of what progress is being made. And so we asked two questions and I'm gonna put these together and then pass it over to Clint and uh, Bernard for their feedback. But first we wanted to look back and we're like, when did you even start doing this? When did you start planning or implementing each of these outcomes? Again, it's that same list of outcomes that we looked at on the prior slide. and. I'm going to say this was actually my personal biggest surprise in this study is that um, most of these started within the past two years only. This is a relatively new thing for a lot of these companies to be um, starting to work on this. You see that red dotted line there uh, is the 70 percent and that two years ago is on the wrong, you know, on the other side of that 70 percent line. So mm. these are relatively new. Um, and then as we look forward, we asked, so that was like past two years. Now let's look at what's happening in the next two years. And we asked, again, looking at these outcomes, what are you investing in over the next two years? And we see, first of all, people are in, uh, you know, investing in these outcomes and we're seeing MFA is topping that list at 42%. But you look at, you know, the beginning investment for all of these outcomes, the number who do that just in the past two years and the additional investment that's being made, it, it strikes me as just a sign that there's a lot of momentum here. And um, I'm wondering, uh, what is the um, you know big story here, Bernard? Maybe I'll start with you here. A lot of data, um, but is there anything in that that you know really jumps out at you as promising or worrisome? Well, worrisome for sure is the three percent of them who are not investing in any of them. 
am. Now that's that's an interesting data point. Now, if I were to just guess, is it is it because that they've attained the Nirvana state and all those other <laughs> outcomes that you asked, or or they're already done, <laughs> or just <laughs> yeah, and they're like, okay, we're done. We we, we got everything in order, right? So yeah, I, I think that's definitely uh, one one thing that concerns me there. Yeah, that's great, Clint. What about you? Yeah, it it would be interesting to maybe talk about or or have a discussion among security leaders about what would be a good prioritized order to approach these in. Um, and I might also encourage people to think about instead of all privileged access requires MSA, MFA, that should really be all access requires mm -hmm. MFA. Like I have unprivileged users, you know, standard sort of, you know, users in the organization. But if a username and password is all you need to get into their account, it's really easy to fish them, right? I can throw a page that looks like an Outlook login page and prompt them for their username and password. And, you know, we see it all the time with phishing tests and other things, you're going to get a percentage of your users who um, do that, who type their username and password and give it give it to the bad guys, right? <clears throat> and yeah, maybe when they're logged in, maybe you have everything else locked down and they're not really going to be able to, they don't have admin rights on their laptop. They're not going to be able to elevate permissions in some other place in your organization, but they're still going to be able to internally fish other employees, right? And, and work your way or just sit and monitor, you know, sort of email conversations and these types of things. I, I think really that should just be table stakes unless, I don't know, you have some really pressing user friction issue that, that you just can't overcome. I, I think it's really common. I, Bernard, Diane, you probably have this too. Like my bank, uh, every bank that, that I've used online um, requires MFA, right? I think, geez, some of like my utility companies and credit card companies, everybody's moving to that. I think users are becoming more accustomed to that and it's not maybe as much of a challenge as, as it used to be. Um, yeah, I'm going to say my mom now has MFA with her bank and can, you know, get right. a text and log on. So, yeah, this is definitely something that is, sorry, mom, don't, not, no offense, but um, it's, it, it is something. You're, you're right. I hadn't thought about it, that it's, if you can do it for, you know, your uh, music account, you can do it for an important work account, right? Yeah, we just had that conversation internally the other day about, you know, one last thing that, that you know, didn't have it and we're putting it on and there was that concern and we're like, well, actually, let's, let's try and think of anything in our non-work life that doesn't use it. And we were, we were struggling to come up with anything. So mm -hmm. I, I think people are ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so one last uh, look at security outcomes and then we'll switch into our last topic for our session. Um, we, so we went back to those people that we had mentioned earlier who had said that they had suffered an identity related breach uh, in the past two years. And we asked them with this list of outcomes, hey, if you had done these, could you have prevented or at least minimized that breach? And again, showed them the um, outcomes uh overall? And the answer was yes. 93% um, came out and said, you know what, we could have done better uh, if we had been looking at these um, security outcomes. So um, Bernard, let me start with you on this one. So, you know, the research seems to show that security and identity stakeholders see value in the outcomes. Um, but of course, these all work together as part of a security program. So what do, what can, of course, you don't know specifically what the breaches were or what they were thinking, but um, does this make sense to you? Um, yes, but again, like the others, the previous slide, the number that stands out to me, the 7% who say none of this would have helped. Um, so <laughs> really interesting there. Right. And it then, is a bit defeatist, right? Your job is to prevent these, and you're like, ah, I couldn't have done anything. <laughs> yeah, it's like given giving up, right? And and mm -hmm. then also the the other part here is um, to the the point that Clint made in the earlier slide was now you see implement MFA for all users showing up there as as a you know hindsight we should have done it for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. so that's 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 a good um, kind of uh, retrospect in terms of, uh, and, and what we've been always hearing and advising is MFA should just be table stakes, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, those are the two things that really stand out to me in, in, in this slide. Yeah, there, there's probably an analogy here to sort of public safety, right? Or when you're out and about walking around and, and you'll hear sort of 
personal safety people talk about, you know, don't look like a victim, be paying attention, be alert, the, you know, these mm -hmm. types of things. Um, I, I think for a lot of security practitioners, the goal is to not be, you know, the slowest zebra in the herd. And the more of this you do, you raise that difficulty level, right? And I think I, I, everyone I know, they're, they're very realistic about like, hey, incidents are going to happen. Um, it's, it's, you know, a fact of life, we can't prevent everything, but let's try and make it as hard as we can for them. So, you know, hopefully most of those people, when they're coming in, they just keep running into uh, challenges and friction and getting controls and roadblocks thrown in their faces. And they're like, ah, you know, forget this place. Let's go find someplace that's easier, right? Great, excellent. So we're gonna change gears now, and for the time we have remaining in our session, I wanna talk about ownership, about the people. I think this is sometimes the most interesting piece of a research project, is there's the technology, but what do people think about it? How are organizations changing? Um, and we saw, in there, and there's a lot more about this in the report. If this interests you, I'd encourage you to read that. We certainly saw 90% of our security and identity stakeholders uh, agreeing that identity, the practice of identity used to be all about just access and now it really is about security. So as you know, time has gone by, just the focus has changed. We saw, and again, not a apples to apples comparison because we asked the questions kind of differently, but in 2019, we saw 53% for about half saying that security, uh, security has any kind of ownership role in um, identities. And we saw that jump to 87% this year saying the CISO has, or top security executive, has a leadership role. So from you know half to 83%, again, slightly different question, but a huge jump in the data just in terms of ownership. And so one of the things that, um, you know, and you see the data here on this slide that the CIO is, is involved, sometimes just strategy, sometimes strategy and implementation, sometimes not. But um, Clint, let me start with you. Yeah, as a CISO, do you think leadership and identities matter? Uh, you know, and organizationally, how do you make that work? Do you have advice to other CISOs who maybe are thinking about structure? What are your thoughts on organization? Yeah, this is something that I really struggle with. So uh, in a previous role, I had the opportunity or, or was sort of forced to um, take over operational IT in addition to security. And uh, you know, my background is in operational IT, but I've been doing security for a long time. Um, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be great. Like all the things that, all the security priorities that we couldn't get done, uh, now they're gonna be IT priorities, right? Because now I'm, I'm running IT. Uh, and the complete opposite happened when, and some of this has to do with resourcing, I think, right? But when you're, that, that conflict of interest is very real. And when you own uh, IT or the implementation in this case, uh, and now you're sort of being held accountable for uptime and availability and maintenance windows, and, and you're sort of, you, you know, the business often cares more about those metrics, quite frankly, than, than security, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't care if it's, uh, secure if it's offline, right? That we're like, we're not doing business and that's sort of the first priority. Uh, and when I owned IT, security actually got worse at the company. So <laughs> after that experience, I, I think I have sort of, well, one, a new appreciation for what all the IT people are, are struggling with every day and uh, a better appreciation, I think, for, for or desire to not own the implementation um, and, and really have the strategy and be more of sort of, um, guiding and directing or holding people accountable or sort of setting goals for the organization, owning the strategy, but not the implementation. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Bernard, what have you seen? Has your organization been changing in terms of this kind of ownership? Do you have a best practice that you'd think about? Or is this just hard? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I, th I think the, the the encouraging part for me in this, in this metric is uh, that regardless of who, um, who's owning the implementation, the CISO is involved in, in the strategy, right? I think that's that's what I, um, you know, that's what I kind of focus on in this deck. Uh, but also there is, what, what concerns me is that 4% uh, the CISO is not involved in either. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's not good. So <laughs> that's, that's not part. Uh, right, that's not good. 
Yeah. Yeah. I have some security friends who uh, the opportunity presented it to them, to them, or you know, presented itself to them, and they went and and took IT for just that reason. They wanted to, to own the implementation, and it's been going great for them. So it could be. I mean, maybe if if this happens in your life for folks listening, maybe don't shy away from it. Maybe the question I would be asking is, will I have the resources to do both? Like, am I going to get the support to maintain IT, but also do the security things that I want? Because oftentimes if they're separate, you have separate budgets, right? So, you know, if that gets combined, are you still going to be able to do the things that you, that you want to do? Hire the people that you need to not only keep the things uh, up and running, but also patch them or, or add additional you know, security controls to them. We have just a few minutes left in our session, so I wanted to leave the audience with one last data point, which is that it is interesting to see that when the CISO has more ownership, whether strategy or whatever, they do better with their security outcomes, their uh, your identity-related uh, security outcomes, a clear correlation between uh, the CISO's involvement and uh, implementation. So, um, But I do want to wrap up today. I want to give our wonderful guest, Bernard Clint, thank you so much. I've learned stuff today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And I want to give you each a chance to add anything at all that um, you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up today. Bernard, let me start with you. Um, uh, any last thoughts? Yeah, I think these these um, the, uh, the, the data points were definitely insightful. And I would encourage um, anybody who's uh, involved in these kind of initiatives in their respective organization to really think about um, how, how do you keep the uh, the security controls agile and being able to uh, adapt and adopt um, um, controls in a very um, seamless and simplified way, right? I think that is the key because many times um, we can talk about all these different uh, great controls out there, but if, if it is not effective and if it cannot be used, you know, it's, a, it's only as good as it's on the paper. Great, thank you, Bernard. And Clint, last word to you in our remaining uh, minutes. I love the data point from that last slide. This is something that I've been really conflicted about and, and torn with the having implementation or just strategy. I was really heartened to see that it's sort of a mix in some areas. Uh, CISOs who just had strategy had a better outcome and some who had strategy and implementation had better outcomes in other areas. Um, and, and the fact that both of those bars were much higher than the CISO doesn't own the strategy. So I, I found that really encouraging and maybe I can spend less sleepless nights worrying about it and think, oh, either path I take, we're still gonna get better. Perfect. Well, thanks again so much to um, Bernard uh, Dewerker from Intuit and Clint from Robert Hoff. So enjoyed our conversation and that is our time.